Okay, let's move to discussing criminal responsibility evaluations, otherwise known as insanity evaluations. It is important to distinguish that criminal responsibility refers to one's state of mind at the time of the alleged crime. It is not a psychological term, even though it is commonly used as one. It is rather a legal term. Early concepts of criminal responsibility were elaborated in Greek philosophy. Aristotle stated, a person is morally responsible if, with knowledge of the circumstances and in absence of external compulsion, he deliberately chooses to commit a specific act. There have also been various insanity tests over time, one of the first being the right-wrong test. Under Roman law, if a child or an insane person committed homicide, he or she was not held accountable because, quote, the one is excused by the innocence of his intentions, the other by the fact of his misfortune, end quote. In Britain, during the 18th century, children less than age 7 were not held responsible and children over 14 were held responsible for their crimes. In order to convict children between 7 and 14, the facts must establish that the defendant could discern between good and evil. The right-wrong test serves as a precursor to later insanity statutes that include the element that the person is so mentally ill that they do not know that what they are doing is wrong. Another test was the wild beast test. This was derived from the case of Rex v. Arnold in 1724. The judge's charge to the jury was, quote, a man must be totally deprived of his understanding and memory so as not to know what he is doing, no more than an infant, a brute, or a wild beast, end quote. This also serves as a precursor to language in future insanity statutes that a person is so mentally ill that they do not know the nature and quality of their actions. This test established the insanity or wild beast standard in England for more than 75 years. And of course, it made its way over the pond to the United States. From there, we have more modern definitions of insanity. The first was the McNaughton test, which was established in 1843 in England. McNaughton was a Scottish woodturner who felt persecuted for several years. He stopped the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, and during an assassination attempt, mistook his secretary, Edward Drummond, for him. McNaughton was found insane, which was followed by public outrage and the expressed concern of Queen Victoria. Subsequently, 15 judges of the Supreme Court were called together and asked to articulate answers to specific questions about the insanity defense. They stated, To establish a defense on the ground of insanity, it must be clearly proved that, at the time of the committing the act, the party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from disease of the mind as not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing, or, if he did know it, that he did not know what he was doing was wrong. Let's dissect this rule so you can get a better understanding of what it refers to. First, it discusses a mental disorder or defect. Generally, defect denotes a condition from birth, such as mental retardation, while disorder refers to an acquired pathology, such as schizophrenia. Most states specifically exclude personality disorders, adjustment disorders, and seizure disorders under mental disorder or defect. In addition, being intoxic intoxicated on a substance of any kind also does not meet this standard. 
The second part of the standard refers to the fact that a person failed to know or understand one or more of the following, the nature of the act, the quality of the act, and or the wrongfulness of the act. The first two, nature and quality, are commonly referred to as the cognitive standard, while the third part, wrongfulness, is referred to as the morality prong. With regard to the cognitive standard, most people assume that nature and quality are the same thing, but they actually aren't. Nature is focused on the actual physical act. In other words, did the defendant understand that he or she was engaging in the physical act of strangulation? On the other hand, quality is a broader term and encompasses an understanding of the ramifications of the behavior. For example, did the defendant understand that such strangulation would result in death? It is important to note that nature and quality do not refer to whether or not the person did engage in those thoughts, but whether or not he or she could have engaged in those thoughts. Are they capable of engaging in those thoughts? Let's look at some examples. This first one is an example of nature. An individual during a dream state strangles his partner's throat but believes in the dream he is actually wringing out a towel. This person would not understand the nature of their act. The second example is an individual who purposely strangles another person, believing he can later bring the person back to life. This person fails to understand the quality of their act. In other words, that death is not reversible. With regard to the moral prong or wrongfulness, the most commonly held interpretation is that one can be found insane if one truly believes the act was morally justified. However, in People v. Coddington in 2000, the court noted that the morality in question did not have to originate from Judeo-Christian beliefs or a belief in God at all, but must come from more than the individual's belief system. Through case law, the courts have found that the question is not whether the person's individual belief regarding the moral morality of the act, but whether or not he or she knew the act violated collective morality. So in general, does society find that murder is collectively wrong? Only a year after the McNaughton case, a different standard was introduced in the United States, known as the Irresistible Impulse Test. In this case, the judge stated, if some controlling disease was, in truth, the acting power within him, which he could not resist, then he will not be responsible. Essentially, it's saying that you can't blame a person or deter others who, because of a mental disease or defect, lose their self-control and cannot bring their actions into conformance with what the law requires. The test they used to measure this was the policeman at the elbow test. And they said that this tested one's ability to reframe. In this method, they examined whether the person would have stopped his or her behavior if a policeman came on the scene at the moment the act was about to happen, or if a witness was present. So could that person have stopped themselves had a policeman been there? Later in 1955, in response to the dissatisfaction with the previously mentioned insanity standards, the American Law Institute created the Substantial Capacity Test and incorporated it into the Model Penal Code. It stated, a person is not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time of such conduct, as a result of mental disease or defect, he lacks substantial capacity either to appreciate, both intellectually and emotionally, the wrongfulness of his conduct or to resist the impulse to do so.
This standard basically attempts to combine McNaughton with the irresistible impulse test. It has three prongs. The intellectual, which is a failure to know that what he was doing was wrong. The effective emotional piece, which is a failure to appreciate emotionally the wrongfulness of the act. And the volitional piece, an inability to resist the impulse. And then in 1981, National Commission on the Causes and Prevention of Violence constructed a portrait. He is a loner. He is alienated from family and friends. He is unemployed. He desperately needs a social identity. He is classically John W. Hinckley Jr., who targeted President Ronald Reagan. There can be little question about uh, Reagan's popularity. He was elected in a landslide in 1980 uh, and, and re-elected. So the nation was shocked uh, when on March 30th, uh, 1981, uh, an assassin, would be assassin, nearly killed him. After giving an address to a labor group at the Washington Hilton Hotel, Reagan left for the presidential limousine, smiling and waving to reporters and well-wishers. Hinckley stepped forward and in a crouched professional manner with both hands on the weapon began firing shots. One bullet had struck the president in the arm, another hit press secretary Brady in the forehead, a third hit a secret service agent, wounding him critically. was quickly subdued. The president thought the pain in his chest came from a rib broken by an agent pushing him to safety. But Secret Service man Jerry Parr saw blood on Reagan's lips and saved him by diverting the limousine from the White House to George Washington Hospital. It was also quite remarkable that Reagan, a man in his 70s, not, not, not a young fellow, uh, took this bullet and uh, survived and recovered and uh, didn't seem to have any lasting health effect on him whatsoever. Secret Service agents were all over Hinckley as the last shot was fired. Who was this seemingly inoffensive young man who fitted the commission's portrait so well? John W. Hinckley Jr. was the third child of uh, what could be uh, described uh, as a typical, uh, perhaps an ideal American family. There was nothing Hinckley's prosperous father wouldn't do for his family. He eventually moved them to the posh Denver suburb of Evergreen, Colorado. John Hinckley uh, graduated from high school in Dallas. Uh, he was sort of kid nobody really remembered at that point. He was basically invisible. He attended college but never graduated, then drifted around the country. At one point, he joined the American Nazi Party, only to be rejected later because of a violent temper. There's no evidence that he had any particular political motivation. Uh, what uh, seemed to have come out was that he wanted to impress uh, the movie star, Jerry Forster, who he had an obsession with. He just happened to see a movie which had a profound effect uh, on him. And uh, that movie was Taxi Driver, uh, a film that... Uh, depicts the life of uh, a would-be assassin who, who becomes a mass murderer. Part of a letter he wrote to the actress read, Jody, I would abandon this idea of getting Reagan in a minute if I could only win your heart. I am doing all this for your sake. Reagan's wounding by Hinckley helped unite the country behind him. And he began to lead a swing against a half century of expansive national programs. It would, for better or worse, starkly alter the long course of the nation. 
After a jury acquitted Hinckley of 13 assault, murder, and weapons counts by finding him not guilty by reason of insanity, there was an immediate public outcry against what many perceived to be a loophole in the justice system that allowed an obviously guilty man to escape punishment. There were widespread calls for the abolishment or at least the substantial revision of the insanity plea laws. After the Hinckley acquittal, members of Congress responded to the public outrage by introducing 26 separate pieces of legislation designed to abolish or modify the insanity defense. At the time of Hinckley's trial, all but one federal circuit had adopted the ALI substantial capacity test. And all the new proposals were aimed at creating a stricter federal standard that would avoid acquittals like Hinckley's in the future. The debates on this legislation reflected the public's indignation over the Hinckley decision. Senator Strom Thurmond criticized the insanity defense for exonerating a defendant who obviously planned and knew exactly what he was doing. Senator Dan Quayle claimed the insanity defense, quote, pampered criminals, end quote, allowing them to kill quote, with impunity, end quote. This hyperbolic testimony was countered by psychiatric and legal professionals who called for the modification rather than the total abolition of the insanity defense. And ultimately, the resulting leg legislation, the Insanity Defense Reform Act of 1984, was somewhat of a compromise. The insanity defense was not abolished, but the ALI test was discarded in favor of a stricter version, which more closely resembled McNaughton. In order to qualify, an insanity defendant must show that his mental disease or defect is severe. The volitional prong of the test, which excused a defendant who lacked the capacity to control his behavior, was eliminated. In effect, Congress returned to the 19th century right-wrong standard, echoing Queen Victoria's response to the McNaughton acquittal. Congress also adopted a number of provisions that toughened procedural barriers to a successful insanity defense. Before Hinckley, the burden of proof in federal cases was on the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a defendant was sane. The post-Hinckley reform legislation shifted the burden to the defendant to prove with clear and convincing evidence that he was legally insane at the time of the crime. The scope of expert psychiatric testimony was severely limited, and stricter procedures governing the hospitalization and release of insanity equities were adopted. Following Congress's lead, more than 30 states made changes to their insanity defense statutes in the wake of the Hinckley verdict. Over the 1980s and the 1990s, many shifted the burden and standard of proof in ways to make it more difficult to sustain an, an insanity plea, moving away from the ALI standard back towards the more restrictive McNaughton test. In addition to raising more procedural hurdles, for a successful inf insanity defense. Many states enacted laws providing more for more restrictive confinement options for those acquitted by reason of insanity. Four states, Kansas, Utah, Montana, and Idaho have abolished the defense altogether. The introduction of the guilty but mentally ill verdict in many states is the biggest development in insanity defense laws since the post-Hinckley reforms. A sort of hybrid alternative to an acquittal by reason of insanity, a defendant who receives a GBMI verdict is still considered legally guilty of the crime in question, but since he is mentally ill, he is entitled to receive mental health treatment while institutionalized. If his systems remit, however, 
he is re required to serve out the remainder of his sentence in a regular correctional facility unlike a defendant who was acquitted by reason of insanity, who must be released if it is determined he is no longer dangerous to himself or others. In 2000, at least 20 states had instituted GBMI provisions. Let's look at the Colorado statute. The applicable test of insanity in Colorado shall be a person who is so diseased or defective in mind at the time of the commission of the act as to be incapable of distinguishing right from wrong with respect to that act is not accountable, except that care should be taken not to confuse such mental disease or defect with moral obliquity, mental depravity, or passion growing out of anger, revenge, hatred, or other motives in kindred evil conditions. Four, when the act is induced by any of these causes, the person is accountable to the law. Or, a person who suffered from a condition of mind caused by mental disease or defect that prevented the person from forming a culpable mental state that is an essential element of a crime charged. But care should be taken not to confuse such mental disease or defect with moral obliquity, mental depravity, or passion growing out of anger, revenge, hatred, or other motives in kindred evil conditions because when the act is induced by any of these causes, the person is accountable to the law. In Colorado, the insanity standard is a modified version of McNaughton and the irresistible impulse test. Additionally, in Colorado, the burden of proof is on the state. Therefore, if a defendant enters a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, the state must prove that they were not insane at the time of the crime, as opposed to the burden being on the defendant, which the defendant must show that they were mentally ill at the time of the crime. So currently, 26 states and the federal government use the McNaughton Law, or Rule. 20 states and the District of Columbia use the ALI, ALI test. As I stated earlier, Kansas, Idaho, Montana, and Utah do not use the insanity defense anymore. Seven states use the G, GBMI verdict, including Idaho, Montana, and Utah. So Idaho, Montana, and Utah, while they abolished the insanity defense, have something very similar. Aside from Colorado, 10 states have the burden of proof on the state. Okay, I know all of you have heard about the Twinkie defense, so I figured we should cover it so you can understand what really happened in that case. In 1985, newly elected San Francisco City Councilman Dan White shot dead fellow Councilman Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone. At his trial for murder, White's defense team presented psychiatric evidence that White's mental illness caused him to significantly increase his consumption of junk food, i.e. Twinkies, to deal with his problems, which made him feel more depressed, which increased the likelihood of violent actions. Contrary to common belief, White's attorneys did not argue that the Twinkies were the cause of White's actions, but that their consumption was symptomatic of his underlying depression. Twinkies were never even mentioned in the courtroom during the White trial, nor did the defense ever claim that White was on a sugar rush and committed the murders as a result. However, one reporter's use of the term Twinkie defense caught on and stuck, leading to a persistent misunderstanding by the public. The jury convicted him on only one of two charges of voluntary manslaughter instead of first degree murder. Even though this is an often misunderstood case, there are other defenses that have come up and given the insanity defense a bad name. Recently, Red Bull was part of an insanity case as a Florida man accused of suffocating his father while he was hopped up on Red Bull, he was eventually found not guilty by reason of insanity.
All right, let's look at some facts. First and foremost, insanity defenses are incredibly rare. Overall, the insanity defense is raised in just 1% of cases. And of those cases, it's only successful in 25%. Of those 25%, only 7% were verdicts given by juries. So actually, most of the insanity verdicts were handed out when the trier of fact is a judge. And to put it in perspective, for every one defendant that a jury finds not guilty by reason of insanity, there are a hundred more that have been found incompetent to stand trial. So where do they all go? Well, they go to a psychiatric hospital instead of prison, and they typically serve longer sentences than they would have served if they went to prison. But here is a look at what it is like. Never see in person. Inside of a mental institution that houses criminally insane patients. This is St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., as captured in a remarkable movie shot last year by the patients themselves. One of them is Lewis Ecker, who raped, beat, and strangled to death a U.S. Senator's aide more than four decades ago. I came in in 1967. That's like 43 years that I. The movie's two young filmmakers, Joy Haynes and Ellie Walton, got the hospital's permission to put cameras in the hands of a few select patients. This unprecedented access was granted to give the public a better understanding of what happens to a person who is found not guilty by reason of insanity. It's unfiltered because it's told through the eyes, through, through their eyes. And what did you learn about them? What did you learn about mental illness? For me, like, I learned the capacity for healing and the capacity for, for change, and they talk about that a lot, that they really wanted to communicate how much over these past decades they themselves have, have transformed. And I think that's what's so great is that we do get to peek inside, so we don't have to imagine what it's like in there anymore. We, we actually know. Why featured men involved in murder, sex crimes, assault, but even if the filmmakers present them as aging patients who are not as dangerous as they once were, at George Washington University, legal expert Jonathan Turley knows the public is not nearly so understanding, especially in high-profile cases like the shooting of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. Her attacker, Jared Lee Loeffner, was recently found mentally unfit to stand trial. The fact is that... The insanity defense is almost never used in the United States. By the 1920s, many courts had agreed that sometimes people were seized by irresistible urges to be violent. Proving insanity was still hard, but then, 30 years ago, legal experts say one shooting made it almost impossible. The 1981 attack on President Ronald Reagan and his party by John Hinckley shocked the nation. And so did the courts finding that Hinckley, who had a fixation on actress Jodie Foster, was not guilty by reason of insanity. The backlash was immediate. Congress tightened the federal rules for insanity defenses, and 30 states did the same. You have to be virtually chewing the carpet in the courtroom to, to qualify for the insanity defense. You have to be so insane, you can't tell the difference of right and wrong. For a person who is not mentally ill, prison is generally a better deal. After all, in the mental institution, only the doctors can determine when the patient is finally released. It's more likely the person will spend more time in a mental institution than they will in a prison. Many of these people will get 20 to life, and they'll be out before 20 years. If you go to a mental institution for murder, you'll likely spend the rest of your life there. All of the patients in the St. Elizabeth's film believe someday, some way, they will be released. But many of them have said that for years. This week, a federal judge sided with prosecutors who want to forcibly medicate Loeffner so he can someday stand trial. Experts believe lawyers on both sides of this case will know whether that treatment is successful later this year. Jim Acosta, CNN, Washington. As you can see at the end of that video, he even mixed up the difference between competency and insanity. Before we end, let's talk about some myths and facts regarding the insanity defense. 
First, myth or fact, clever defendants routinely fake insanity in order to get out of trouble. This is a myth. It is unlikely that many criminal defendants attempt to fake insanity because it is very risky for any criminal defendant. If you plead insanity, all chances to plea bargain and contest material facts of the case are lost. In order to plead insanity, the defendant must admit to committing the crime in question, which negates a not guilty verdict. This can be particularly risky when the other evidence against the defendant is weak or circumstantial. The insanity defense is overused. This is a myth. As we talked about earlier, the insanity defense is used in only about 1% of all felony cases and is successful in just one quarter of those cases. 90% of Americans believe the insanity defense is a ticket to freedom for murderers. This is a fact. This is generally what Americans believe. Myth or fact, the insanity defense is also used for nonviolent offenses. This is a fact. The perception is that the insanity defense is used almost exclusively for violent crime. However, nonviolent offenses account for 31.6% of defendants on felony charges. Myth or fact, insanity equities are quickly released. This is a myth. Following an NGRI verdict, between 84 and 95% of acquittees are hospitalized long-term and only 4% are conditionally released. Conditionally released means they're still stepped down into halfway housing and being monitor monitored. Myth or fact, trials are a battle of the experts. This is actually a myth, as mental health examiners agree on a primary diagnosis in 81% of the cases they examine. 